It's time to meet Clifton. With your host, Ray Grabowski. Here's Ray. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Meet Clifton. We'd like to say that tonight will be a great show. We have a lot of interesting guests, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Oh, you're just a fool. You know you're in love. Tonight's guests are Senior Outreach Coordinator Danielle O'Wimren and Outreach Coordinator John Plunkett from Blue Cross Recovery Center. Georgine Trinkle, Executive Consultant at Community Action Partnership, CAP, New Jersey. And Paulina D. Berenstein, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist at One Day at a Time Nutrition Counseling. So sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Meet Clifton. Okay, well, welcome back. My first guests are here tonight uh, from the uh, neighboring drug and alcohol rehab, Blue Crest Recovery Center, right here in Woodland Park. I'd like to welcome Danielle O'Winrin and John Plunkett. They're both uh, senior outreach coordinators, and uh, John is an outreach coordinator. So, of course, we know there's a big opioid epidemic in the country, and you know recovery is tough, and a lot of people have trouble finding recovery centers. Mm. Um, and we know that this is probably the biggest epidemic that this country has seen in a long time. And it, it's very serious, so this segment is, is very important. Um, I'd like to start out with saying, uh, you know, that we see the, the Blue Crest on 46, but uh, w one of these can start with what is the center? And, uh, you know, what's involved in it? So, sure, I'll start if it's okay. okay. Sure, um, sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having us, Ray. Uh, it's no, great to be you. here. It's very important. And um, Clifton's a tremendous town, big town, a lot of legacy uh, activity in this town. So it's great to be here. So thanks for having us. Oh, thank you. And so Blue Crest Recovery Center is a drug and alcohol rehab. So we work with and help adults 18 years of age and older get clean and sober from drug and alcohol addiction. And the way that we do that is we work with the 12 steps. This is where 12 steps actually meets clinical. So we have 50 full-time employees, of which there are 15 mm -hmm. licensed and accredited master's counselors that mm -hmm. run group. There's roughly 20 to 25 groups a day. And in concert with running group, they have one-on-one -on -one sessions with the clients. And this is, so this is Blue Crest working with the 12 steps and clinical coming together. We're an abstinence-based um, right. uh, rehab, believing that abstinence is the way to go, as any other methods that are out there. Some folks think there are other ways to go, and that, that might be applicable for various individuals. We're not saying that, but we believe in abstinence at Blue Crest, and um, we're, we're out there providing services for over five years now. Okay, and let me just ask you, what's the average age group? Is there an average age group, or what do you, what do you mostly see? Is it young adults, or? I would say it's it's really a healthy range. It really is. It's it's a mixture. You're going to get some of your 18 year olds. We even have you know some 60 year olds. I think it's a healthy range of a mix of in between, really. No, because you know you always hear it's kids, but it's not always kids. No, it's not. You know, just like we know, you know, addiction doesn't have uh, you know an age or a race or anything right. like that. It affects everybody at all different. And it's not. And you know, people look at this, the, the drug user and alcohol, they have a certain look. That's not true, right? Professionals? It's something that really and truly um, affects everyone. You know, people come in, we see people coming in very high functioning, or maybe, you know, maybe more of a spiritual bottom, or maybe, maybe more of a physical bottom. It right. just really depends. So when they come, what levels of care do we offer? Sure. So there are various levels of care that we offer at Blue Crest. So uh, partial hospitalization with sober living, and then there um, are various levels of intensive outpatient uh, programs that we run five, three, two days a week. And then there are, uh, are outpatient services that we run as well. So Blue Crest is operational uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 9, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And the, 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 the building is really humming throughout the day, um, offering those levels of care. Um, can people stay? Do you have like overnight people that are there for, let's say, you know, some drink centers, they're there for 30 days or something like do you have, is that. Do you offer something like this? So thank you for asking that. I think that's a really good question. Um, the day in the life. Um, we like to say we take a little bit of a modern approach on what rehab is. Uh, years ago, and I know some facilities, they, um, you know, they take the individual and they're removed from everything for right. a certain amount of time. 
and uh, we just don't feel that's realistic to remove somebody um, from everything for a period of time and then just shove them back into the world. We like mm -hmm. to say, you know, get sober where you live within your community. So they're living in houses, beautiful houses, stunning houses that are staffed and monitored 24 seven, going to outside meetings. Um, we have sober activities on the weekend. We have a uh, family day uh, visiting on Sundays and it really simulates real life. So by the time they're leaving, they're doing all those day-to-day -day things that they would be doing when they're transitioning right. back to home that they would be doing once they get home. They're just changing their living environment. Yeah, I can appreciate it. And does, this I know, when they come in, do they have a specific counselor that they answer to? Or is it sort of like technically going to school and you have different teachers? And you know, what does that look like when they come in? They, do they have classes? What happens here? Well, they're, they have groups, okay, groups, and they are assigned a counselor. So once they come in and meet with uh, the psych med team and go through admissions, what have you, they are assigned then a counselor. And that's very strategic, because right. we understand what their profile is and which counselor, male or female, and that, that quality skill set should be aligned with that individual client. So they are assigned a, a counselor. And then those counselors run groups themselves, right. and then there's one-on-one -on -one with the clients and the counselors. And to Danielle's point earlier, we do then bake in the other areas of Bluecrest, which would be the family component, um, the spiritual component. We have a Catholic priest on staff. Um, and then we also have case management and an alumni team that all work together with the individuals while they're with us to set them on their journey. So we're really setting a very healthy foundation when they first come to Bluecrest with our entire team. Right. And the counselors are a huge part of that. Right. And, and to your point, some of the other drug centers you go on for 30 days, you're kind of locked in, um, going through withdrawals, and they scare you and whatever. And this probably is a little more user-friendly, per se. I would say, you know, I think sometimes people see on TV of what this sort of stuff looks like, and it can be really scary, scary. you know? Um, and what does that entail? And I think there's such a stigma sometimes even asking for help or maybe even not even identifying or relating that you even need help. Right. You know, maybe somebody's coming in high functioning and all the things that are, you know, they're still able to go to work, they're still able to show up, but they're struggling with um, silently. Um, I think it's really important when they come in, everything is very real life and structured. You're getting the quality care that you need, but you're not being, um, sometimes people feel like it's a punishment. You know, I think it takes a lot to ask for help and properly receive it. Mm, right. For so long, people could identify the problem, but for us, it's so important to give them the proper solution that they could take with them when they go home. That to us is a, a success. Because okay. they don't want to feel like they're in prison. They want to feel like a human being looking for help. And that's a, another question too. How, how do they come to you? Like someone's having a problem. They, how would they get in touch with, you know, obviously we're going to list the name and stuff, sure. but would they be referred to from a doctor or could they just walk in on their own? It's, um, it's a great <clears throat> question. It comes from many avenues. It could be, the, could be the parents, it could be the job site, could be their therapist, could be the local hospital, could be an extended family member, could be their neighbor. It's all possibilities. It's a great question. Um, and we're very much in tune given our season track record of five years plus with all of the therapists and the hospitals uh, the police departments, the fire departments, EMS, et cetera, in this entire New York metro area. So they, most of these folks know who we are and vice versa. So we're in constant communication, particularly with the therapists, mm. because in today's environment with mental health being what it is, particularly coming off of COVID, right. isolation, <clears throat> anxiety, and so on, we're finding people that typically haven't used are using. Right, which mm -hmm. may have caused a bigger problem for this because of the COVID isolation. Well, yeah, because you figure, Certain jobs, you know, people were, you know, maybe they have to go home and they have some sort of accountability for a period of time. They're going to work where now everything for a while was behind a screen. It's very easy to hide it for right. a long time. And right. that's really we're seeing people in worse conditions than we ever have right. because they've had a substantial amount of time mm -hmm. um, to themselves abusing whatever it is that they are abusing. Right. And, and you have to take that seriously. People lost their jobs. Right. Um, they're isolated which they may not have had a drug or alcohol problem, but for some people it, it could have created it. So, you know, centers like yours are important. And, you know, one, one pretty much last question that either one or both can answer, how important is the family to this? You know, their, their involvement with someone, providing they want to be involved. How important is, is that for recovery? 
I think it's tremendous, you know, um, long-term recovery in myself, you know, and my family were a big monumental support team for me. Um, they were able to see my truth before I was even able to mm -hmm. see my truth, you know, and we want to lend the support to the families. We have a, a night dedicated just to them. Uh, okay. It's on Wednesday nights. It's available to all. They don't just have to be, uh, you know, an individual who's in with us. They can come, you know, because I think it's really hard for the family um, when you see your loved one struggling and you can't do anything about it, unfortunately, we can't love our loved ones into sobriety or getting yeah, help. Exactly. You know, so how do we give them the support that they need in the situation that they're in? And they're all in different levels. Maybe some of the family members, they don't have somebody in with us. Maybe somebody is, or maybe somebody has graduated out. Um, but we want to give that support to them. We think it's very, very important. And I know I'm, I'm getting off a tangent here, but do you have programs for the family Sort of like, you know, Al Anon has something for, do sure. you have something where the family could come in uh, with, from, from a patient or something that you give them support or some kind of training on how to deal with someone like this? We, we open up our doors to the family. So okay. we're an extended part. The Blue Crest family is an extended part of the client family. Mm -hmm. So we invite them in. Um, and, and folks that uh, uh, want to come in and be educated for free on what we do when it's family night, we open up our doors to any and all. Right. to come in and be educated in a very safe, stigma-free environment. But we're an extended, fam right. extended family within the family, to your point. And um, family night's tremendous. Um, lots of emotion, lots of raw emotion right. comes out. This is where there's a lot of growth. Somewhat of the disease leaving us uh, uh, through those tears, those alligator tears. So um, no, the family dynamic is, is critical. It adds to the, the cornerstone foundation of their sobriety as they're right. with us and then when they leave us as well. Because okay. you know society, families and friends, they don't always understand this. So they might not take kindly to someone like this or they might shun them. They don't understand a lot of it is disease. Mm. Addiction is not something you go out and you want to be. Um, so yeah. the families need to understand. So Yeah, um, the support of the family is really important. But at the same time, you know, people get scared to come in or ask for help, like I said before, but when they come in and they see what a realistic environment we have there, and they think they have this idea in their mind of it being this jail-like setting or right. hospital setting where, you know, exactly. their clothes are removed and they're, they're just wearing a hospital gown. We're very real life in that way where the day-to-day -day changes there, you know, they're coming from the houses right. to the, the facility nine to three, but then they're having that change of pace. They're going home right. and then they're going to an outside meeting. So it's very realistic and people don't feel like they're in the lockdown right. facility. And for the alcoholic mind, like I was saying before, mm -hmm. when you're in a place and you're in there for 30 days, 40 days, and you're not really doing anything, um, my mind is gonna lie to me one more time and say, when I go home, I don't have to do those things because I haven't wanted to drink since right. I've been in there the entire time. But I haven't wanted to drink because I've been in a controlled environment right. the entire right. time. So that's why it's important for us to provide the tools when they're in with us. We want to show you what recovery is in real time while you're here. So when you go home, you have many days that you've already been doing that. Right. And that's a great approach. Uh, you know, I, I know we're working on this. It's a problem in the world. Like I said, the opioid epidemic is, is serious. Um, I mean, I'm glad you both came on to explain this to the people at home, and hopefully more people will take this, you know, the reality of it seriously and seek help or ask loved ones to get help. But um, thank you both for coming on. Thank you I for having us. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hello, Clifton and friends, and welcome to the updates. I'm Sharon Corbanix. Well, there's a lot that has been happening around town in Clifton, but before I get into that, I want to give a big thank you, warm Big thank you to the firefighter, uh, Oleg uh, Shakov of Clifton, who had watched his native land burn, and he had already collected over 100 turnout uniforms to be donated to Ukraine. They were featured on Eyewitness News, and also when the word got out, the Clifton entire fire department uh, sent the word out to other fire departments so that uh, they could see how they could chime in and help with the cause. So again, a big shout out to firefighter Oleg uh, Shakov of Clifton, New Jersey, and his colleagues and all the other fire departments in Clifton for the big donation for helping Ukraine in their current plight. And hopefully we'll have a quick end to that as well. Now, uh, if you want to reach out and do a humanitarian drive for Ukraine, they are doing that through uh, the UAYA Passaic CYM. And you can call Liliana at 
3899 to make your donation. And the information is also on the uh, website on the Clifton Channel. So there are more details if you'd like to contact her personally and uh, donate whatever you can. Now, the Art Center has been very busy. Roxanne Camilleri has been doing quite a few webinars over the past few months, and there are some new ones coming up on Tuesday, March 29th. It's Fabrics, Fact and Fiction. So please either go to the uh, Clifton Art Center website or give a call at 973-472-5499 for more information. And that is Tuesday, March 29th from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Then there is also another a Zoom presentation, the Art of Light Stained Glass Art, and that's Monday, April 25th from 4.30 to 5.30. Again, please contact 973-472-5499. And the host would be Judith Heimer of the Stained Glass uh, Artist and owner of Heimer and Company Stained Glass Studios. So uh, please uh, try to attend their Zoominar website as well. And uh, in person, we have some things coming up. Uh, join us on Saturday, April 2nd from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. You get to meet Miss New Jersey. Uh, so there's a talent and beauty that you can uh, definitely chat with her. There'll be presentations. And uh, again, that's at the Clifton Arts Center. And uh, information, if you need more, is 973-472-5499 or again on the uh, Clifton Art Center website. And April 13th through April 30th, Wednesday through Saturday, 1 p.m. until 4 p.m., they are going to have the Clifton High School student artists do their presentation. And this is uh, involving all of the Clifton students in uh, Clifton High School. Their artwork, uh, they've been growing this uh, endeavor over the years. Uh, they are looking forward to this because uh, previously they couldn't do it because of the pandemic, but now they will be out and about and it's called uh, Silver Lining. So hopefully you'll see the silver lining and all that we had to go through. Um, but uh, please try to attend April 13th through April 30th and support the Clifton High School students and their artwork. You never know where the next wonderful artist may come from. So I uh, wanted to uh, Again, give a shout out to the firefighters of Clifton. Thank you so much for the donations. And again, we can't be uh, over in the country uh, to support them by their side, but we are supporting them in spirit and in hope to a, a clear end to this uh, problem, a very uh, serious problem. So hopefully you'll join us in making any donations, uh, but if not, your prayers are always welcome. So thank you again for tuning in. We appreciate your support and your time. And hopefully, again, we'll see you around town. Thank you. Welcome back. My next guest, Georgine Trinkle. She's the Executive Consultant, Community Action Partnership, CAP of New Jersey. Uh, so Georgine, let's just start right in. Uh, what is a Community Action Network? Great, so I am the consultant for Community Action Partnership of New Jersey. Okay. We're the training arm for all of the statewide community action agencies in New Jersey. Our community action network is made up of a thousand agencies across the country, and we have 25 in New Jersey, and there are five that serve Passaic County, and we're delivering critical services to individuals that may be experiencing a temporary hardship, or it may be something that's longer term and requires broader solutions. Okay, so th that's a lot of information here, but so what are some of the services, because that's what I want to start with, that the residents of Clifton may be eligible for? So in Passaic County, our agencies deliver services such as Head Start programs, which is a free uh, preschool and learning program. We have Home Energy Assistance Program. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Sometimes you hear that no, as live. Only through and g but. Yeah, well, that's perfect, because we actually can help people who are having a hard time paying their bill or have a utility really? disconnect. And, a what, and one of the newer programs our network's delivering is for the water program. So it's a water assistance program. So these services are all under the umbrella of the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs, but they're federal funds. And we want residents to be aware of what's happening. So if they're having a temporary hardship, if it's food, or they're worried about housing or paying a mortgage even, weatherizing their home, saving energy. We have all of those services here in New Jersey and in Passaic County. So, but how is this broadcasted or how do they find out or where is it available? Someone's having, with the, 
website, where do they go? So they can go to www.capnj.org, and that has all of the agencies in New Jersey that provide services, or they can go to the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs Community website, Affairs. and they have all, all of the agencies by county, by phone number, by website, and this past year, we actually have launched some electronic applications. So for right. our more savvy listeners and watchers and viewers here that want to go online, they can actually fill out an application online. Wow. But finally. I, I know, I, no, finally. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to put that somewhere in this broadcast, the okay. WWCAP. Because I've, I've never heard of this, so I, I'm really new to it. So um, I need to maybe an example of the Community Action Network. Sure. So in Pisgah County, um, we have agencies like the Patterson Task Force, we have Greater Bergen Community Action Partnership, and they actually have a credit union. That's how broad our services wow. are. Okay, that's, that's quite a bit. And how, is this federally funded or is this? Yes, this is federal funds that come through and it's a pass through to the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. Okay. So we have actually an infusion of CARES funding and because of smart legislators that have increased the eligibility guidelines, we can actually serve more people than ever before. Obviously, there's more of a need, right. but at least we can respond to that community need. So when people apply, is there, I guess there's certain criteria for... There is. You're absolutely right. Always there's... The criteria. Yeah. There's always some something that you have to do, um, maybe paperwork, it could be electronic. But in addition to that, our agencies also have other services. So that's why we don't hold to a fast rule. Right. Our poverty guidelines are 200% for CSBG funding, but our agencies serve, have other funding and serve people with higher poverty guidelines. Right, because so sometimes it's based on salary or... Right, um, yeah, <coughs> and there's disregards, what they call, you know, all, all the bureaucracy. Yeah, and there's <laughs> a lot of it too, because a lot of people get frustrated with these kind of things. You know, we tell them you can apply for this, you can apply for that, and then do it, and they you get the runaround. So it's frustrating. It can be really frustrating. That's why we try to streamline it, um, and that's why going through our agencies, they can screen them for multiple services at one time, sometimes with one universal application. Right. So it really pays to connect to the local agency. And does this cater to any? Does this look? Is this something for elderly also? Obviously, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Any any person that needs help. Anyone who needs help. And you named a few, um, and you said there's a thousand agencies. Um, across the, the country. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm obviously interested in what Clifton people can apply for. Absolutely, and Passaic uh, County is one of the agencies that receives CSVG funding. So also contacting or connecting with the Passaic County um, organization will help these families and individuals. So, so you mentioned seniors, and I really appreciate you bringing up that population. They're definitely vulnerable. We have programs like weatherization, which can reduce their energy burden, not just once, but ongoing. And it also obviously helps the environment. So we really want people to take advantage. I respect people who are really proud. They don't want to ask for help, but going that, taking that extra step and asking for help can end up really changing, changing your life with right. our agencies and our network. And you have the stigma thing where people, there's a stigma to asking for help. And, there is, um, and it's hard to ask for help, but it's worth it. Especially when you need it, and that's what that's what you're there for. Actually, and we all need help. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes we need cough drops. You know, yeah, whatever. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, and we have here on, the, on one of your questions is how many law enforcement agencies? So what does law enforcement have to do with this? Yeah. Part? So I wanted to spotlight one of the projects for our network that I'm especially proud about, which we launched a statewide cop um, shop with a cop shop. hero program. This year, the first time, so it was a pilot, we had 25 law enforcement agencies across New Jersey and about nine community action agencies throughout New Jersey, and we took children shopping with law enforcement, um, and we were able to build some relationships. Many of those relationships continue past the one day. We had a lot of retail partners, and it was just a great way to demonstrate how we can collaborate with one another and how we can right. really address the issue where youth really don't have the opportunity to have a positive experience with yeah, law plus enforcement. Plus, I guess it's like a connection between the police and the person they're shopping with. Yes. Make it look more, a friend, more friendly because, you know, cops are getting a bad rap lately. Um, it also helps they'll develop a relationship. They'll get to know the officer's name. Maybe they'll see them in the community. Right. Hi, officer. You they'll know. feel more comfortable if they need to approach a, a police officer, which, which is a great thing. Uh, how many 
and then, of course, how many children are served in these we programs? We served over a thousand children in our first year for the wow. Shop with a Cop Hero really? program. Yeah, I'm so proud of, of it, our agencies, our law enforcement partners, and, and the youth that signed up for it. It was, um, you know, just such an amazing program. And really, it was one day, but it's something that's going to continue and build other relationships. Right, and it's important. I, I'm, not, I'm seeing here why is this project so important, but like you're saying, and we could elaborate on that, the kids established a rapport with cops. Absolutely, in that age group, we really target middle school children, and if you think about it, where the school resource officers are or where the lead program may be occurring isn't necessarily that age group, but right. that age group is critical. I, I do a lot of juvenile detention alternative initiatives, and the one thing that we know is that the relationship where children can feel that trust to the law enforcement, ask them a question, talk to them. And the other side is for law enforcement too, to have that positive experience, right. to get that smile, yeah, spending yeah, that because, time with yeah, that child. Yeah, they're going through some tough times now, uh, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, the police, and it, it builds trust, I guess, for the kids too, so. It's all about the relationship, right? If, if you know Absolutely. someone, you feel trust, yeah, you right. can and establish that. You learn something that, that might have been different. They saw something on TV that w wasn't, police officer friendly, so now they're seeing that's not what it's all about. Absolutely, so, and, and it, as a community, we need to create those opportunities for both the youth and the law enforcement. Right. No, I appreciate that. A lot of good information. Thank We're gonna you. put the website for the people to contact because there are services available. Most people don't know. Hopefully they'll watch this and they'll see it. Georgine, thank you. I appreciate it for coming on. Great, thank um, you. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. My next guest is Paulina Berenstain. She's a registered dietitian nutritionist um, from the Nutritional Counseling Center. But we're gonna get into that. The subject tonight would be medical nutrition, therapy, and diabetes. So we're gonna try to focus on the diabetes part, but welcome to the show. Thank um, you. And I wanna ask you, what is medical nutrition therapy? Uh, medical nutrition therapy is a um, nutrition-based treatment provided by a registered dietitian nutritionist. It includes a nutrition diagnosis okay. and intervention, as well as counseling services to help manage different conditions, including obesity, diabetes, prediabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, fatty liver disease and optimal nutrition. Okay, um, now we're gonna talk about diabetes and we'll get into it further, but can diabetes be controlled by diet at some point? It's not only the diet, but it's lifestyle changes. Okay, so the, what's diabetes first? So, so people understand what we're talking so about. So diabetes is when either your body doesn't know how to use the insulin your body produces right. or your body does not produce enough insulin which causes your um, blood glucose levels like, to be elevated right. okay so um, medical nutrition therapy now how does that help manage the diabetes well uh, the doctor either your PCP or your endocrinologist will um, set target levels that are good for you and each person is different right. so it's individualized and uh, based on those target levels i'll uh, work with you with the lifestyle changes right. to make sure that you meet those target levels on a daily basis and also right after you eat your meals we want to make sure those target levels are met right and in the long run, when you do that, you are taking care of your eyes, your heart, your right. kidneys. You're less likely to get amputations. Right, because that's, that's part of diabetes too, amputations, eye disease. So but we're going to talk about nutrition, and I'm going to show these portion plates that are, will have them flowing through this segment. Um, we're lucky enough to have these. 
Um, so portion control. So well, let's talk about the foods that you're going to prescribe or what people should eat and why these portion controls are so important. It is important for people who do have diabetes to make sure that they um, include a little bit of, um, of everything. I, I really do like the plate method because it's easy. You get a dinner size plate or nine inch plate from the supermarket, like uh, paper plates, and half of the plate should be any vegetables, any vegetables that you like. It doesn't have to be any specific vegetables, but vegetables you like. Um, quarter of your plate as a starchy foods and quarter of your plate as protein foods. And this can help you uh, control your blood glucose levels. Also, if you do have problems with, a lot of the people with diabetes have problems with being a little bit overweight, so it can help them uh, lose weight with the plate method. And then also physical activity is important. Like right after eating, maybe wait five minutes, take a walk 10 minutes, and walking is medicine. It can right. bring the numbers down too. Just explain this one, because it's different. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in the practice, we also see um, kids. So the kids will, it's, it's a little bit different. So a, a quarter of the plate for them is going to be vegetables. And then a um, quarter of the plate will be fruits and then the same for the, for adults quarter as protein and quarter as starchy foods so this is for children yes for children to make it easy so. <laughs> yeah to make it easy for them especially now that diabetes is on the rise for the uh for kids but they're saying diabetes is is almost epidemic stages in the united states now Yes, and more and more kids are being diagnosed with diabetes, right. especially the type 2 diabetes. So what are the benefits of having your uh, diabetes under control? So the benefits, um, like I ex explained before, it's just making sure all your body is running in um, aligned with the way it's supposed to. So right. when your blood glucose are elevated, your cells are not, they don't function the way they're supposed to be functioning. Right. So that's when you start to have um, eye disease, you start to have heart problems, kidney. A lot of the people who do have diabetes and they're not, th their diabetes is not under control, what happens is in the long run, they end up with uh, dialysis. So their kidneys just stop functioning. Right. So when they do have their, um, diabetes under control through medical nutrition therapy, uh, we make sure we prevent that. Okay, and of course there's always the issue of how much does this cost and does insurance cover this? And I don't know if insurance covers medical nutrition therapy? Yes, some of the in insurances do cover medical nutrition therapy and I'm actually impressed some of the doctors uh, don't know that Medicare, which is for uh, 65 and older and people who are on disability, uh, pays for medical nutrition therapy. They do pay three hours the first year, three hours. and then after that, the following two, the following years, they pay two hours of medical nutrition therapy. So, how long is the session then? Usually, the initial session will be for one hour. One hour. And then after that, either 30 minutes or uh, 45 minutes. And we do the follow-ups depending on the patient. If the patient do re really needs a lot of help, right. uh, a, a mon monthly follow-ups. But maybe after that patient got the hang of it, so then it will be like every three months. So how many sessions are required at first? Probably two or three, right, at the beginning? Yeah, so the, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, they're suggesting that the people that come and, and, and get more sessions throughout the year, right. it's more beneficial because a lot of it, it's going to be repetition because we're not only working on um, just changes that you have to make, but it, it's on your behavior. So right. we're trying to change on the behavior. So the repetition, the right. more you do it, the better. So uh, yeah, the beginning will be like three, four years. Right. I mean, three, four times. Times, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and this is important, and I'm glad you came on to talk about this. Um, lifestyle is very important, diet and nutrition, because diabetes is a very serious problem, especially with the younger kids now, and I'm sure you probably see that. And sometimes the parents aren't as helpful because, you know, kids, they want this, they want that. So would you also counsel the parents if a young child comes in? Do you talk to the parents? about what to do with these kids? Yeah, when uh, young kids do come to my office, I, pretty much the intervention is to the uh, parents right. more than uh, to the kid. 
Right, because yeah. it's important that the parent follows up with all of this. So, yes. I mean, if you're having a problem, this is a very big issue. Uh, you should maybe seek out some type of nutritional therapy because diabetes is a serious problem. And thank you for explaining that to us. Um, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank you. So that's our show for tonight. I'd like to thank all our guests for coming on. I'd like to thank the staff and crew for helping out. And welcome to spring, everyone. And we'll see you on the next show. But in the meantime, be good to your friends and family. Respect your neighbors. Keep Clifton close to your heart. This is a great city. Thank you. God bless. Good night.